Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, making this event possible and for allowing me. And thank you also for this previous talk because that was really a great, great presentation. So the bar is set very high. And yeah, I'll do my best to kind of be as at least half as good. So I will just share my presentation now. Can you see that? Please let me know if you can't see the. It works fine. Yeah, okay. If it works fine, then great. Okay, so I'm Maciej Kurzyński. I'm a um, PhD candidate at the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at Stanford University. And today I'm going to talk about the technology of the sublime in modern Chinese narratives. Um, so the sublime has proven a useful interpretive category in the studies of modern Chinese culture to such an extent that it seems almost impossible today to disentangle the sublime from the analysis of the modern Chinese nation state and the ways it imagines itself. So numerous scholars have shown how Chinese art in the 20th century responded to historical challenges requiring new ways of representation. Um, how, dictum, how the dictum man must conquer nature, Ren Ding Sheng Tian, underlay the collective endeavor to bend the physical world to human will, and how Chinese artists tapped into the potential of grand scale imagery to represent the nation state. And such growing scholarship on the sublime in non-Western context, I believe, makes it necessary um, to reconsider the possibility of this peculiar experience from a broader cross-cultural perspective. Um, at the same time, we should also be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and dismiss the manifold insights that Western aesthetic thought has still to offer. So the starting point of my inquiry is the notion of sensory motor schema. The so schemas are spatial and force dynamic patterns that underlie more complex conceptual structures such as metaphors and figurative language. For example, when we say that a melody is rising or moving somewhere, or we, we, we use the spatial schema of movement or upward movement to make sense of an oral experience. Um, similarly, emotions are often said to reside in one's heart, which involves the schema container and the conceptual metaphor heart is a container. So schemas as contours of experience in a way allow us to travel between different modes of experience and underlie the ways in which we understand the world. So philosophers frequently employed spatial metaphors of elevation or rise, as well as boundaries or barriers to make sense of the experience that they called sublime, but an equally prominent feature in their discussions is the sequential nature of such experience. So for instance, Immanuel Kant argues that the sublime takes place whenever the effort of comprehension exceeds the capacity of the imagination to comprehend the progressive apprehension in one whole of intuition. Burke argued that the succession and uniformity of parts are what constitute the artificial infinite. And Mendelssohn defined the sublime as an experience in which a single impression is repeated without alteration uniformly and frequently. In fact, Longinus in his treatise Perihipsos or on the sublime already pointed to dense composition as a rhetorical effect whereby one great phrase after another is wheeled into place with increasing force. And I believe that these definitions all hint at the crucial characteristics of the sublime and in particular the sublime in literature. Um, whereas the schemas of rising motion and boundary underlie the developments within the plot, that is to say like the hero can become stronger or an obstacle is finally overcome. These are, so these are the elements that we can retell when someone asks us the question, what is the story about? The feature of sequentiality by contrast should be measurable on the formal level of the novel, that is to say in the vocabulary. So in other words, if stories meant to provoke sublime experiences are narrated by novelists as complex dynamic metaphors mapped upon the schema of sequential ascent beyond a boundary, and I suggest that we should be able to discover regularities in the very language of the narrative. So the first step is to find kind of the building blocks of the sublime sequence. In modern China, the Taoist parable of the foolish old man who removed the mountains and the story of the great Yu controlling the waters have been appropriated to promote the aesthetic of hero worship and collective voluntarism. But there is yet another text, I believe, that proved equally, if not more stimulating to modern Chinese imagination. And this is Maxim Gorky's famous poem, Song of the Stormy Petrel. So Stormy Petrel became a kind of triumphant harbinger of revolution and an embodiment of idealist fervor, not only in the Soviet Union, but also in the PRC and other socialist states. 
So in the poem, the word tempest or storm, Bao Feng Yu, is the kind of keyword of this text as demonstrated by its last three lines. So I will read now. Tempest, please notice the repetition. Tempest, soon will strike the tempest. That is the courageous petrel proudly soaring in the lightning over the sea's roar of fury. Cries of victory, the prophet. Let the tempest come strike harder. So given that Gorky here entangles concepts from two distinct domains, the politically charged victory and prophet on the one hand, and the kind of powerful natural phenomena like tempest and ocean on the other, his poem provides a perfect example of how a deliberate synchronization of two kinds of vocabulary can enhance a political message. And my goal in this project is to generalize the structure of Gorky's poem so as to discover similar semantic entanglements in much longer novelistic texts. So in order to find words and phrases synonymous with terms such as tempest, fierce, thunder, and sea in modern literary Chinese, I use a publicly available word to back model trained on thousands of works of modern Chinese literature and a search for words and expressions whose vector representations are closest to the vector corresponding to the word tempest, Bao Fengyu, as well as sums of pairs of vectors corresponding to key terms in Gorky's poem, such as dark clouds, ocean, lightning, thunder, and fears. And I select top 50 synonyms for each of these queries, which method allows uh, the presence of tempest kind of as, 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 as a the tempest to be kind of a guiding aesthetic idea while at the same time allowing at the same time allowing for variation within the vocabulary selection process. And I further add 150 handpicked terms and expressions which have not been found by the model but nevertheless constitute kind of the staple of sublime imagery, words such as mighty, wei da, torrent, jilio, or surge, yunglio. So in total, this um, semi-supervised procedure gives me 317 words and phrases which I call the sublime vocabulary, and they constitute kind of the building blocks onto which the schema of sequential ascent is mapped by the narrative. So the next step is to find words correlated with the vocabulary of the sublime in the narrative space of the novel. What discourses parasitize our visceral reactions to powerful natural phenomena as they are described in the text? We need to find the vocabulary in the novel that is analogous to the sublime, that is to say it appears in parallel with the sublime words, but nevertheless remains heterogeneous since it does not contain the sublime words themselves. And one way to do that is through topic modeling. So in the topic model, every topic is a list of words with associated probabilities indicating how representative a word is for a particular topic. And we can use this method to find kind of groups of words that occur together more frequently if they were randomly than if they were randomly distributed in the text. For example, if a story features a central hero, then uh, a good topic model should be able to detect words and expressions that the author uses to describe this hero, like including the hero's name, frequent interlocutors, recurrent ideas and places, etc. So to a certain degree of approximation, we can reduce the novel's plot to computational topics, which further implies that this dynamics of the sublime narrative can be understood as a steady, homogeneous accumulation of the sublime vocabulary that ultimately finds its euphoric conclusion, a boundary narrated in the story through topical vocabulary. So it is narrated, the boundary will be narrated in the plot that we now understand as topical vocabulary uh, found through the model. So as the topical plot vocabulary evolves in parallel to the sublime, it can be considered analogous, but since it does not contain any sublime words, it remains heterogeneous. So to find the plot vocabulary correlated with the sublime in the novel, I first separate the text of the novel into overlapping windows of 500 words and run a series of 20 LDA topic models on it from K equals 10 to, 10 to K equals 200 on these 500 word chunks. For every topic generated by each of the, um, for every topic generated by each of the models, um, I take the terms included in the top 10% of the probability distribution of the topic over the words of the novel, and then note down their frequency in each of these 500 word windows, which I then compare with the frequency of the sublime vocabulary. And the higher the correlation between these two series of frequencies, the stronger the relationship between a particular topic and the sublime. In other words, if it is the case that increased presence of the sublime vocabulary entails increased presence of the topical vocabulary of the plot vocabulary, then this topic in question is considered as correlated or as a parasite. And I collect the words belonging to the three most strongly correlated topics in each model, which allows me to capture general 
plot-related terms co-occurring with the sublime terms throughout the novel from topic models with low k values, as well as more specific expressions related to singular events, if any, that occasioned a sudden increase of the sublime from models with high k values. Okay, so, so far I have determined these two sets of vocabulary. I have the sublime, I have the plot, but this information is still not specific enough to answer the question as to exactly how a particular novel entangles the vocabularies in a diachronic series to produce this powerful visceral reading experience in question here. So back to Longinus. So as we remember, Longinus argued that in the sublime, one great phrase after another is wheeled into place with increasing force. And I take great phrase here literally. So a great sentence is a sentence that contains at least one word from the sublime vocabulary that we have just determined. For example, in Gorky's poem, that would be, for example, uh, let the tempest come strike harder. A tempest is a, a sublime word. So in this sense, the following two great sentences should be considered as considering a sequence. And the second sentence does not really provide any new information, but only quantitatively augments the imagery already provided by the first one. The more sentences there are that contain the sublime vocabulary, the more sequential a particular fragment of the novel becomes, and the more likely this kind of blow after blow experience for the reader. And now my claim is that these sublime sentences are parasitized by topical words, by the plot. Um, the working hypothesis in this paper is that the span within which a topical word benefits from this kind of sublime aura is two sentences to the left and to the right. In other words, I draw a co-occurrence edge between the sublime node, sorry, between a sublime node and a, a topical node or the plot node if the distance between them does not exceed two sentences. And in this sense, again, uh, the word Shengli or victory would collocate with the word tempest in Gorky's poem. And the edge distance is further quantified as inversely proportional to the number of co-occurrences. If two terms appear together three times within the distance of two sentences, the distance between them will be one third, for example. So one way of interpreting this process is to say that while topical words, the correlated vocabulary acquire sublimity from the sublime words in their neighborhood, the sublime nodes simultaneously acquire local novel specific information from the terms, from the topical terms that surround them. And if the author provides enough great sentences and then describes some momentous event using the parasitizing vocabulary, some sort of boundaries finally cross in the plot, like two lovers finally find each other, or a mountain peak is re reached, or like the uh, other side of the river is conquered, then the sublime experience has a chance of arising. So the last piece of the puzzle is to find the key nodes in the network, which topical and which sublime words are prioritized by the narrative and which terms from one group are most strongly synchronized with the words from another group within the narrative flow. So if two terms can be considered synchronized, if they reappear frequently together, then kind of network measure that can capture the synchronization of groups of words is eigenvector centrality, since it determines the level of connectedness of a node. So nodes with well-connected neighbors, whose neighbors in turn are also well-connected, will have high eigenvector centrality. And this measure is particularly helpful here because it corresponds with the reason behind separating the nodes into two categories, sublime and topical. An important sublime node will be synchronized with many well-connected topical nodes, and an important topical node will be, will be synchronized with multiple well-connected sublime nodes. So to sum up, what I'm trying to kind of outline here in terms of methodology, it's kind of the technology of the sublime, a narrative mechanism that synchronizes plot development with vocabulary distribution into a sequential ascent beyond the boundary. And following this methodology, I would like now to quickly show this mechanism in action by rereading two modern Chinese novels, Second San, The Argataya by Liu Baiyu, and Soul Mountain by Gao Xinjian. And from the perspective of traditional literary scholarship, one would be really hard pressed to choose two texts more different from each other, one championing a kind of collective political ideal through the lens of socialist realism, the other focusing on individual quest for meaning and truth. However, I believe that the computational theory of the sublime will disclose numerous commonplaces, commonplaces nonetheless. Okay, so the second sum. So following the method explained above, I generate 20 topic models and plot the vocal vocabulary distribution in order to determine how the author designed the emotional flow of the text. From these two graphs, we can see clearly how the topical vocabulary is bottom graph closely follow the distribution of the sublime vocabulary in the upper graph. I really don't know how better to visualize 
these two processes that are at the same time heterogeneous and yet analogous. These two distributions follow each other, but nevertheless remain distinct. Second Sun, as a novel, focuses on the relentless struggle of the Liberation Army in the Hubei province as the soldiers conquest subsequent cities in pursuit of Qin Baijie, who is the captured daughter of Qin Zhen, the deputy commander. Qin Zhen's daughter also happens to be the beloved one of Qin Zhen's protégé, the division, division commander Chen Wenhong, and hence the kind of military confrontation acquires deep personal significance. As the Liberation Army struggles to conquer Wuhan before the city is destroyed by the retreating Guomindang forces, the soldiers face the turbulent waters of the Yangtze River. Later on, as the war spreads further south, the scorching heat, swarms of mosquitoes, torrential rains, and devastating floods bring tremendous difficulties to the soldiers accustomed to the more temperate northern climate. Nevertheless, the Wuling Mountains and the Yangtze River provide a perfect scenic backdrop for their heroic bravery. So the crossing of the Yangtze River by the Liberation Army is the most intense episode in the middle, right in the middle of the story both in terms of plot development as well as vocabulary distribution. So right in the middle of the novel, the Liberation Army faces the tremendous powers of the untamed nature of China's South. As, as the writer puts it, two mighty torrents formed between heaven and earth. One was the torrent of nature with raging waters and powerful thunders. One was the torrent of the people struggling bravely against the waves. If the former was violent, the latter, latter was fearless. It is exactly these two mighty torrents that spurred into existence a human life's most precious character, spirit power. So in this fragment, Chen Wenhong, the hero, serves as a kind of focused imaginarius and shapes the emotional geography of the text, bringing to the fore the fortitude of the soldiers under his command who march forward and cross the mighty Yangtze while being shelled by the enemy forces entrenched on the other side. So by incessantly repeating the hero's name once every five sentences almost, which itself hints at the literary sublime Wenhong, and by surrounding it with the ever-expanding masses of images and feelings, Liu Bayu attempts to synchronize the two dimensions of the narrative and kind of the syllogistic progression of the plot on the one side and the vocabulary distribution on the other, and to transform the human into the super, superhuman. Um, here are the tables like for the data, which I used for my interpretation. Uh, I will just not delve that into that because I, I don't have time, but I will just show you another example towards the end of the story, Qin Zhen reluctantly leaves the battlefield to attend the grand, grand ceremony of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. And here again, we have the same mechanism. Um, the description is full of sublime terms describing the rising red flag, which again is, is a moment of crossing the boundary between the pre and post-1949 China. So the nationalist discourse here um, embraces the sublime on the square and absorbs a number of sublime words such as to seethe, to tremor, or ocean. And this metaphorical work is, is done through such heavy lifting uh, by means of words. So I don't have time to, to kind of go into, very, into much detail here, but the same happens in Soul Mountain. In the novel, we can see an, an, a dream narrated by the, by the hero, um, which is very much erotic in nature. And here again, the kind of, um, in this fragment, women's breasts, intense emotions, and blood pulsating under the skin all serve as markers of erotic sensuality, pushing this asymptotic narrative towards the powerful climax. As in Second Sun, where the founding ceremony awoke everyone present from the somnolence, from the somnolence of Lucian's Iron House to the modern nation state, here it is in the pitch black space that the sublime takes place, the women's breasts providing the form, the, the reimagined square on which the sublime rite is to be reenacted. Okay, so conclusion. Um, computational criticism, I believe, can draw our attention to the ways in which the formal arrangement of vocabulary works in synchrony with the novel's plot to achieve a powerful aesthetic effect that we can now theorize as the sublime. And we should see the sublime as the embodied experience of sequential ascent beyond the boundary. Finally, kind of the computational theory of the sublime presented here is free from metaphysical claims of Kant's philosophy and therefore can further illuminate our explorations of the sublime in non-Western contexts. Thank you so much and sorry for going over time. No, no, you're perfectly on time. Thank you. Thank you for this. Again, we have five minutes to take questions. There will also be more time after this. Type it in the chat. I can read it for you if you have any problems um, or just raise your hand. I see Tyler.
Hi, Magic. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, fascinating. And um, if you saw my talk, you saw that I was also giving a sense of uh, how to do basic topic modeling and your uh, use of it was clearly uh, well beyond a basic stage. Um, I was curious whether you could clarify a little bit. I didn't quite understand the distinction you make between uh, sublime vocabulary and uh, correlated or topic um, vocabulary. Just, just that distinction would help me a lot, if you don't mind. Yeah, so, um, so sublime vocabulary is not novel specific. It's more about this kind of cultural discourse that is uh, present um, at, an, at one particular time. And I believe that many modern Chinese novels actually exhibit whenever there is something important representing the novel, be it like a founding ceremony, right? Or, or some kind of grand battle, these words will be used more or less. Some of these sublime words will be used. But then my question is how the novel is able to actually combine these sublime words with some other, with, with some other topic or some other, with, with the narration itself. So how the narrative kind of parasitizes on the sublime vocabulary to make this very strong performative statement and to trigger the reader's emotion. So by finding a correlation, correlation between the two, we can see what is meant as important, what is narrated as important by the author or by the narrative itself. And I believe that one marker of this importance is precisely the presence of the sublime vocabulary. So once you see that certain discourses, certain topics are more closely following the sublime vocabulary than the others, then you can say that, okay, so the, the author really paid a lot of attention to these particular topics in his novel, right? Because he believes that it's worthwhile to spend so much time describing them in these sublime terms. Could I follow up? If there are more questions. So um, is that to say that uh, the sublime does not uh, emerge as a um, topic or maybe a split over two topics in the, uh, you, you mentioned that you do 20 different models with a, a range of, of K values of the number of topics. Um, so I'm curious that there must be some that are, um, that are close to what you would identify as sublime and, and how close is that? You're saying they're correlated. Is it we're talking one or two and, and how close is the correlation? So yeah, this is a great question. And actually they do appear in topics. So sublime never appears actually at least from what I know, it never appears as, as one topic, but you can see these sublime words appear in all different kinds of topics, right? And you, so, so you see that in certain topics, there are, more, there, there are more sublime words kind of in the top, like let's say top 10% than in other topics, right? But I remove them from, from, from the topical words because otherwise we would have false positives and we could see the two kind of graphs moving in parallel um because precise because the same words belong to both categories right so so before calculating the correlation i remove the sublime words if any uh from the from the top 10 percent uh words for e every topic uh so that i can see a kind of a more clear correlation between them but they are present during the modeling itself they're not removed as if stop words no 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 they're not removed as stop words and it itself actually proves the point, right? Because if in certain topics we can find this presence of sublime words, that means that this topic itself is very much correlated with, with, with the sublime, right? And certain topics are contain no words related to, to the sublime vocabulary, which means that um, this topic simply, in my interpretation, is not as important for the writer. Thank, Thank you. So you. I look forward Thank to you reading, for reading more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Madalena. Thank you so much.